Welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of RM Military History. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. I wanted to let you know that you can now join our supporting cast over on Patreon. As thanks for your support, you'll be able to help us pick films, submit questions for guests, have first pick on brand new and exclusive merch, and much more. Thank you for your support. Now back to the show. Welcome back to Fighting on Film. This week we are joined by journalist and historian Mark Urban, who fans of the show may or may not know is Stuart Urban's brother, the director of Ungentleman the Act. So we're thrilled to complete the Urban brother duo there. Um, and Mark is perfectly um, excellent. Yeah, fantastic. So happy to have you with us. And this week's film is perfect for Mark to be joining us for because his recent book, The Red Devils, charts the history of the Parachute Regiment during the Second World War. Um, And the the 1953 film, The Red Beret, does just that in its way. I mean, maybe you should start with production, Matt, and we'll go from there. Released in uh, the summer of 1953 in the UK and early 1954 in the US, where it was released as The Big Jump and Paratrooper. Um, directed by uh, Terence Young, who's probably best known for the slew of early Bond films, um, which cemented the, um, the the franchise. But he also directed um, They Were Not Divided uh, in 1950, uh, Storm Over the Nile in 1955, Tank Force in 1958, um, and later Triple Cross in 1966. Uh, the production was... Um, organized by Irving Allen and uh, Albert Broccoli, Cubby Broccoli, um, obviously linked there with Terence Young and the, and the Bond films, um, and Warwick Film Productions, who also produced Cockle Shell Heroes and Tank Force as well. So we've got some nice links there. Yeah, the Bond um, connection the film was strong filmed... this week. E- exactly. Uh, the film was filmed at Shepparton Studios and uh, with, with some um, filming done at RAF Abington and uh, a few... Probably um, army ranges around Brecon, etc. I think at the end of the film, but we'll talk about that. I'm sure. Um, filmed in Technicolor um, and with a budget of just under a million dollars, which is quite a substantial um, budget for the day. So it was a big film, and it did quite well at the box office. Um, interestingly, it was written by an all-American um, screenwriting team: um, Robert. Uh, Maybaum, uh, Cy Barrett, and Frank Nugent. Um, Maybaum had written um, OSS, which Ladd starred in in 1946. He also worked on Cockleshell Heroes, Tank Force, uh, and Battle of Bl- Bloody Beach. So you can see there's some overlap here around Terence Young, uh, Broccoli, and, mm. and some of the writers that they worked with as well. Uh, Barrett had a really interesting uh, career with a number of uh, war movies written. Uh, including 12 O'Clock High, Porkchop Hill, um, The Last Command, uh, Gathering of Eagles, and uh, the, the Shea biopic in the 60s. Um, Nugent, uh, I think his most interesting one for me is he wrote The uh, uh, Northwest Frontier with Kenneth Moore, which is a, a uh, film I love. Yeah. Um, and it's apparently the, the whole film is based on a book by uh, Hilary St. George uh, Sanders, who... Um, it was a World War One veteran who won an MC, um, but during the Second World War, he uh, he wrote a lot of uh, propaganda pamphlets and books. So uh, Battle of Britain, Bomber Command, uh, a number of various other ones. Um, and he wrote also, I believe, uh, a history of the commandos as well, an early one. So interesting mm-hmm. chap. Hillary St. George Sanders, great name. He wrote <laughs> the first stab at um, a kind of history of the parachute regiment in the second world war um and actually i mean well the, the, i don't want to say it's the only attempt to do this before uh, i wrote red devils there were one or two others but um it, it's the only i would say proper attempt and it's actually very good it's a very good book um it's available you can pick it up on ebay or whatever or amazon uh, in a 70s reprint but it, it is a very good book in telling the whole story of of the regiment in the Second World War. So you're right, Matt, that he did write um, some other stuff during the war, which was perhaps less less historical. Yeah, uh, more HMSO he, he was proper, stuff, wasn't it? I think. Yeah, grown up author, proper author. 
Mm. Mm. Um, and then just to round out with some of the production side of things, uh, cinematography was by John Wilcox, who again worked on Cockle Shell Heroes um, and also Carved Their Name with Pride. Uh, music was by John Addison, who you'll probably recognize from his work on, again, Cockle Shell Heroes, yeah. uh, Reach for the Skies, I Was Monty's Double, uh, Guns at Batazi, and Charge the Light Brigade, and of course, A Bridge Too Far. Yeah. So there's a nice airborne link there. Um, and then, of course, I'm think, I think we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later on. One of the uh, advisors on the film was um, was Pine Coffin himself, and there was a lot of uh, involvement from the MOD and, and the Parachute Regiment. Wooden box at the box office. Been dying to say that for weeks. Ah, <laughs> well done. <laughs> so cast-wise, now, the, the movie is uh, led uh, by Alan Ladd, who plays Canada Steve McKendrick. Now, he's a... he's posing as a canadian but he's an american uh, serviceman who somehow has made his way over to england and joined the parachute regiment he he's just an excuse to have a a, a star of the time i think by the studio um, but obviously he uh, he's an american, american actor. lead yeah yeah american actor known for his westerns i think shane comes out in the same year as the uh, red beret was released as a big hit for him um his war movie credits include 1938's come on the leathernecks OSS in 1946, a Korean War film called The McConnell Story in 1955. Um, but he passes away at only at the age of 50 from an accidental overdose um, while he was trying to treat uh, some knee problems that he had while filming a movie. And he, he took too many painkillers and it unfortunately killed him in his sleep. Um, but yeah, so he, you know, quite a prolific actor of his day in noirs and westerns. Then we have Leo Gen playing uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Snow, a clear reference to John Frost. Frost. Um, uh, as we know, again, prolific actor of uh, post-war era, lots of war film credits to his name. I'll just route for a few. Uh, the Way Ahead, The Wooden Horse, uh, The Miniver Story, uh, The Steel Bayonet that we've covered on the show before, 55 Days at Pete King, General Holland during The Longest Day. And he has another connection to another um, paratrooper film as he provided the narration to 1946's Theirs is the Glory. Then we have Harry Andrews as RSM Cameron. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that they've dubbed him because I think that accent that he does is awful. Um, but, you know, we'll see, see what people think. Um, and the Red Beret is his film debut. He goes on to be a familiar face of British war movies in decades after. He's in A Hill in Korea, Ice Cold in Alex, The Best of Enemies, 55 Days at Peking Again, uh, 633 Squadron, The Hill, Play Dirty, Battle of Britain, Too Late the Hero. Um, and his final military role came in 1978 um, when he was in uh, the film adaptation of The Four Feathers. Um, if you're a fan of the show, you'll know Harry Andrews' work. We absolutely love him here at the show. Um, then you have uh, Susan Stephen playing Penny uh, Gardner. She's Canada's love interest. Uh, the Red Berets, her only war movie role. Uh, but her other notable film roles include Carry On Nurse in 1959, The House Across the Lake in 1954, and a film called Pacific Destiny, where she starred alongside Denholm Elliott. Then we have Donald Houston as Taffy Evans, you know, another actor who's just in lots of war movies, it would seem. In that golden era, he's in the Yangtze Incident, 300 Spartans, 633 Squadron again, there's a lot of links here, uh, The Longest Day, and I think his most famous war movie role, uh, is where he played Christensen in Where Eagles Dare, where he got a boot to the face from Richard Burton. That's what I always remember him for. Um, and then he's in The Sea Wolves in 1980. Then we have Anthony Bushell, who plays Major General Whitling. Uh, his credits include 1939's The Lion Has Wings, uh, The Miniver Story, uh, Bitter Victory, Battle of the River Plate. And for any of you science fiction fans out there, he played Colonel Breen in the 1958 Nine series Quartermass and the Pit. I know you're a fan of that, mate. I think that, it's, it's Robbie. I think it's Whiting, isn't it? Was it Whiting? He, oh, sorry, slip of the slip of the keyboard. Yeah, yeah. There. Which is another name pun on Browning. Mm. Um, uh, just course. as the major major snow is a pun on frost, so obviously Whiting is a pun on Browning. Oh, I didn't make the connection. Oh, there we go. And then we have Stanley Baker, very young Stanley Baker, playing Sergeant Breton. Now he's definitely dubbed. Um, it is one of his first big credits and they dub him travesty absolutely shockingly dub him um his credits i can't think how um donald houston's accent is fine being welsh but stanley baker's accent 
isn't for some reason anyway um but his you know this is a breakout year for baker in the same year he goes on to play bennett in the cruel sea and that really establishes him um then he's in hell drivers um, guns of navarone and of course he's child in zulu we don't need to wax lyrical about stanley baker i think everyone who's listening probably knows how famous he goes on to be um and then uh, the final sort of actor of notes that i've got in my notes is um, anton differing plays a polish volunteer called the pole um not and a, a rare a rare role where he's not playing a german yeah so it's really um interesting to see not only a very young anthony differing but one where he's in a denison smock so it was overall i think apart from I'm going to go, I'm going to say it early, but apart from Alan Ladd, I think the rest of the cast is, is really good. Yeah, I think it's, it's a strong, strong enough cast. They all, they all make uh, a good job of what they're given, I think. But yeah, there's, there's something about Ladd that doesn't sit right. And I think it's half the way his character is written and then half the way he's acting the role, I think, perhaps. I don't know what you guys think about that. Mm. The, the, um, there's a weird thing as well in the writing. He, he he's it's sort of implied that he's got a past that he's run away from mm. something in in America, um, but I'm not sure it's ever resolved what what it is. There's um, there's a scene happened. where he's in like a country house with uh, his girlfriend, the yeah. the, uh, the wife Packer, yeah, and he explains that um, he was doing a, a, a test flight with some rockets or some sort of China bomber. And he made his um, co-pilot bail out. Oh, okay. And I've his co-pilot, been, I don't know how I missed Roman that, but... Candled. Yeah, it, it's not the most engaging part of the film. <laughs> <laughs> his, his co-pilot, Roman Candles, and he manages huh. to land the plane safely. So he has this guilt thing where he doesn't want to be in command of anyone. So it kind of makes sense and it does work, but it it takes at least ooh, maybe half the film before they explain that, yeah. which I think yeah. is alluding. Yeah. I think your mention of the Roman candle uh, is not a bad point to say that uh, this this was a term used um, and it, it did catch on in the very early years, in the sort of 1941 period when they were training the first volunteers for a parachute that didn't open. And um, the, 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 the parachute is then plunged to the ground. Yeah. Um, and I would say, I mean, I don't, I'm not going to stumble into um, favourite scenes just yet, but I would say that that bit of the film, which is fairly near the beginning where they're training at, at what would be Ringway near Manchester, yeah. which is where it was done in the war, is pretty good in terms of sort of authenticity, both of sort of language mm. and in terms of what they go through in order to become, you know, badged members of the parachute uh, battalion. So, I, I think that's a pretty good part of the film, and, and in a way, that that use of the term Roman candle is 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 a sort of token of that um, accuracy. I like yeah. that they had Taff reading the like the the the, the handbook, the, the parachute regiment handbook. I like that inclusion, and it's, it had in a little print like second edition. I thought that was quite yeah, quite like neat. That. Yeah, they all yeah. like it's a horror, like a horror novel. I like quite like I like the sort of boy's own feel of that scene. It feels like they're huddling in a in their bunk reading like a ghost story at night and it just sort of yeah. spooks them. I quite like the way they've, they they did that. Um, so moving on to the retro review this week, did you have one, Matt, or did you? No, mate. Oh, brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> so the retro review comes from Red, Reg Whitley. I think we've had some of his reviews before from the Daily Mirror from August the 14th, 1953. When I heard that Hollywood was coming to Britain to produce a picture about our Red Devils, I had my doubts, especially when I found that Alan Ladd was to play the hero. But my fears were unfounded. For the Red Beret turns out to be a good film and is a sincere presentation of a vital aspect of modern war. Based on war historian Hillary St. George's book, uh, St. George Saunders' book, it concerns an American ex officer who, for reasons of his own, becomes a Canadian and serves as a private in the British Parachute Regiment. The story is a bit on the thin, thin side, but there are nerve wracking parachute jumps and a spectacular raid on a secret radar station in France amongst the thrills. Alan Ladd does well as a cantankerous Canadian. Uh, Susan Stephen is the young uh, RAF parachute packer who breaks down his reserve. Leo again makes a dignified CO. Keep your eye on Susan as she has pep and personality. A grand and gripping He-Man picture, but the girls will enjoy it too. Not a bad review. Not um, bad. I like the reserve pun. It's uh, good. I hope that was intentional. Yeah, yeah I think it, Reg, Reg um, adds a bit of colour when we get Reg's yeah, reviews Yeah, he does, on. doesn't he? 
Yeah, no, he's he's not like um, Dick Richards, who's a little bit more po faced with his writing. Um, I find, but it's, it's a decent review. So on to the one word reviews this week. So we had Phil Kane goes with Palm, and there was a picture of the airfield on Twitter. And Mark Mark him, Urban himself commented underneath classic. Ad Bond goes yeah, with a lone sort of palm tree in the middle I know, of it's great. Abingdon or wherever it was. <laughs> Very funny. Someone had some poor um, prop man had to go out and find that. I love that. <laughs> Ad Bond <laughs> says Denison. Kevin Getz goes with Bruneval. Uh, Daniel Michael simply goes with Smock. Uh, Nick Champion says Ali. Tom Petch goes with Hat. Ian Houston goes with Canada, and uh, Brian Williams goes with the bagpipes. And finally. Uh, World War Two support uh, World War Two TV's Paul Woodage, and he he's linked it with dashes. So I guess it's one word. He goes Anton differing a goodie question mark. <laughs> so so it's uh, and I think we had a couple of others that you know someone said poor as well. So it, it wasn't all roses. Um, but no, I think the, the one word reviews never fail to sort of capture a movie in a very short amount of words. Um, yeah, I think you're right. I do. Yeah, I think I think it's a good one. Uh, so, I mean, we should probably move into the alley tally because it'll probably be a bumper crop this week. It's time for alley tally on fighting on film. Mark, you're our guest. Would you like to start off on the alley tally? I'm afraid, Robbie. I'm going to be very. I'm going to be very armored core about this. That's um, fine. <laughs> I really like the appearance of the Humber armoured car. It's really good. Um, which is dressed up as a, as a sort of German Africa Corps armoured car. But it's a proper, I mean, I realise we're only talking about, you know, a few years after the war in any case. So presumably mm. some of these were still kicking around in depots and things. But I like the Humber armoured car. And indeed, if one wants to get really sort of anoraki about it, that I mean, the Germans did capture plenty of them. Yeah. Uh, and they did use them. Uh, and indeed... Uh, the, the the villain of the Arnhem Bridge battle, uh, Gribner, um, is supposed to have died in in a captured Humber armored car, uh, yeah. in in a sort of blaze of of flame when that column came across the Arnhem Bridge on the second day of that battle. Uh, so you know, painted up, uh, you know, obviously in German colours and leading his column of, of SS reconnaissance across the bridge. So, so yeah, I, I think the armoured car is really good. I, I really enjoyed um, seeing it there in the film as an authentic piece of alley uh, yes. World War II. Too. But on the actual, the proper, I mean, if we're going to talk alley in a in true uh, parachute regiment sense of the word, uh, airborne <laughs> stuff, I mean, it is a bit disappointing. For example, the weapons... Uh, they, they have conventional stems, for example, which you can argue is is right for Bruneval. Um, uh, that the, the, the ones with the the, the airborne adapted stems, with the foregrip and and the uh, detachable wooden stock, were not introduced until a bit later. Yeah, yeah. They pop up uh, in the North think... African scenes, don't they? And it's just not correct at all. Well, there's an odd mixture of Thompsons and 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 uh, stens in in north africa which, which um I, I mean i'm not saying it's inconceivable that someone might have been kicking around with a thompson because um mm. they were around in that theater but but yeah the actual so the actual sort of airborne stuff that you'd be hoping for is a bit de deficient there's a, there's another very curious feature of the film which is probably to do with how they filmed it and what the rules were about where they were filming on the stages and stuff but when the guys go into the plains to do their two assault drops on Bruneval and in North Africa, they they fairly obviously don't have any weapons with them. And in fact, they don't have helmets either. They keep their red yeah. berets on. And, <laughs> yeah. um, the, the, you know, whereas in reality, uh, on those drops, many men would have had um, disassembled stens strapped in uh, to their sort of chest rig. Uh, and, and that was the case... Um, with those early drops that they did have stems uh that the, the so-called longs you know that the end fields and the bren guns were in containers that were dropped and in and and in some of the scenes you do actually see the containers so that's a yeah. that's, that's an a accurate bonus. alley yeah. alley feature but, but yeah i'm afraid i i i i opt for my single piece of alley kit i i opt for the humber armored car 
that's a great choice. I think there's um there's a there's a Daimler as well in there and the, there's um I think Gen yeah there's yeah, a column Gen, of Gen sat on the dingo at the end as well yeah yeah there's a column of Daimlers at the end aren't there that sort of link mm. up with the paratroopers who who drop in North Africa I'm a bit of a spoiler alert here I'm such an anorak that I can tell you that they've got their their post war arm of service and other markings on so oh the the red and white yeah yeah. Yeah, the Royal Armour, red and yellow. Uh, 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 oh, yeah. So, so they obviously just borrowed uh, uh, an actual armoured car unit, presumably for yeah. that scene. Um, and just as actually the film of the of the actual drops themselves is clearly uh, from some exercise or other, uh, uh, where they've shown where they've been able to film or take stock footage of paratroopers. Uh, uh, launching themselves out of the doors of, of Dakotas and stuff like that. Uh, another very uh, anoraki point is that in, in the stock footage, you see the uh, you, you see the paratroopers leaping out, and 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 soon after they uh, the shoots open, they drop their kit bags and their weapon valise, as it was called, so that it hangs down beneath them, which was not a practice that was adopted. Uh, in the parachute uh, battalions uh, until the summer of 1943. Mm -hmm. So it wouldn't be right for Bruneval or North Africa, but that's one, that's an anorak point where I think we can, we can, we can chill. We can let them have that one. I mean, it's interesting because, I mean, we've already mentioned that the the drop canisters, but they, you see the leg bags deploy and then you see them all running to, to, um, the, the drop canisters as well, yeah. um, which I think is is a nice inclusion because they could have just left that out. But yeah, there's true. some nice scenes of them opening up the the canisters and there being a load of number fours in there. And in one in one shot, there's actually a um, a Vickers a, a fluted barrel casing Vickers. That's a nice um, touch. Which is, yeah, which is is a nice touch. You don't get to see it in the film, but it's a nice no. touch. As we've already mentioned, Stens. I think this is the only film I've seen where most of the major models are featured in the film you've got the, the mark one star which is very rare you see in films the mark two um and the mark five which is if, if yeah. there'd been a mark three in there we would have we would have had the full gamut of, I of stents i was um, magnifying glassing the screen looking for mark threes and i couldn't see any but i was like please because it would have been the only film where you get you get all the stents but we've had well i've been i've been out anoract here because I, I will confess that I, I could not tell the differences of Mark. I mean, obviously, I know the the airborne modified one uh, yeah. Yeah. to look at, but I, between the early Marks, you, you've got the uh, you've got the edge on me there. Oh, we're a sucker so, for Mark One star stands in movies because they're just so rare. Oh yeah, <laughs> they are super rare. So the, the the easiest way to differentiate them is they have like a full barrel jacket and then a, a pair of sight protectors at the front. The, um, they look a bit like a Mark III, which has got the full barrel jacket, but no sight protectors. Um, the Mark I Star is is the version where they took the wood off it, because initially the Sten gun had wood and a rather large conical flash hider. But they to make it a little bit easy to produce, they took all that all of that off. Uh, I think Lad, Gen, and possibly Andrews are the only people that are seen with those, and mm. it's during the Brunabal raid. And then I think there's a little bit where they're in the... Um, uh i say quarry but it's obviously brecken ranges or somewhere like that um uh at the at the end of the film where they have them as well and i think it's it, it's interesting because i think at bruneval they had the mark twos which is um the, the one with the exposed end of the barrel yeah um because there's some photographs on paradata of the guys coming mm. back on on some of the boats and you can see a couple of mark twos um and i think gen has a, a has a mark two in some of the scenes in in the in what's called Operation Pegasus in the film, but he's obviously quite clearly Bruno Val biting, um, which is really interesting. But there's a whole plethora of, of, of interesting stuff in this film, actually, in terms of, of weapons, just to run some of it down. Um, there is uh, quite a few Brens, um, a couple of Mar anachronistic Mark III sneak in, which is not, not unexpected given the MOD's involvement and it was probably True. just what they had in store. Um, rather than it be something from a uh, film armor. Um, in terms of weapons for the Germans, there's a, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a couple of Germans that have stens and tend onto their sides. Oh, really? I, I didn't see that either. 
amazing yeah. um there's a couple mp40s there's a few um k98ks but i think the germans at brunaval they look a little bit well one in their uniform yeah. don't they they've got that classic they're in that um, 50s trope we haven't got enough uniforms all the way through the war yeah yeah, yeah. um and they also bring up some british three inch mortars in that scene as well which not inconceivable captured at uh you know dunkirk battle of france not inconceivable yeah. at all um i'll let them have that um uh, <laughs> but i think i think the funny part of that scene is um again knocks it knocks them out with a grenade as they're retreating um, yeah. Which suggests that, like within thirty yes, feet, they've, <laughs> they've set the mortar up twenty yards away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they, they're probably yeah firing um, directly upwards to get the, the drop on. Yeah. Them. <laughs> um, and then the only the only other interesting thing that popped up for me um, was the the Panzer Shrek at the end, which they describe as um, uh, a bazooka. Yeah. yeah. And and one of Differing's only uh, only lines in the film is he goes, "Ah, oh, Faust Patrona." Which I think is is quite interesting because not only is that the wrong name for him because that's that was the name for the Panzerfaust, but also um, having a Panzer Shrek in Tunisia in 1943 is completely impossible because the yeah. Panzer Shrek was based on captured American bazookas which were captured in Tunisia yeah. in 1943. Yeah. So you only get the first production Panzer Shreks in in the late fall. Uh, they, they should have had a pier though, Matt, shouldn't they? Like. Where's their they could pits? have had a pier, yeah. Yeah. They could have they could have had a pier. I mean, that wouldn't be out of the, the realms of possibility. Although I don't think they dropped with any during the um the Tunisia drops, did they, Mark? I think they had no. boys. I think you mentioned oh, the no, they didn't have them. Okay. They didn't have them. I, I think they started appearing just before the invasion of Sicily. Mm. Mm. Um yeah, that would make sense. I, the 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 pits in Tunisia were taken over by the uh, small arms school corps. And they started training guys how to use them. And there's oh, one really famous photograph. You've done a fantastic um, tour d'horizon of the uh, of the small arms and stuff there. I mean, I think, I mean, I, for my money, what one um, kind of howler or whatever you want to call it, mistake, I think one can be relaxed about, is to do with the headgear. So mm-hmm. obviously, having co- called the film the Red Beret. Um, that they don't really want to tackle the fact that at Bruneval and during the period when these guys would have been being trained, that they, they didn't have the Red Beret. Um, I, I mean, it, it's curious that the first couple of scenes uh, involving uh, the Johnny Frost character, Major Snow, he is wearing some form of regimental headgear, which, of course, is what Johnny Frost did even well after the Red Beret had been introduced. He was a rather reluctant convert to it. Mm. The other thing, of course, is that the badge, um, even when they got the Red Berets, uh, which they 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 did get them in Tunisia, um, they, for the first uh, several months, wore the Army Air Corps badge rather than the Parachute Regiment badge that we know today. Uh, and it was only really, well, it was another thing like the Piat that appeared in the summer of 1943, the, the Parachute Regiment badge. So I, mean, I think one can be a bit relaxed about that, given that, you know, uh, same with Denison, you know, you can have a big argument about when did it actually come in. You know, there were sort of plain canvas coloured smocks uh, yeah. in use at um, Brunaval, but I don't think one wants to be so anally retained. I know Denison no. is a, okay, has a it's iconic, isn't it? Yeah, because that's what I've yeah. got in my notes. It's, I think, for its it, kit wise, I think it's one of the, be- the best representations of the early parachute regiment on screen because you as you mentioned you've got those uh step in style uh brown s- smocks that are, are based on the Fauschum Jaeger ones um and then you move on to the Denison and you've got those the early parachutist training helmets that look always look to me like the Star Wars rebels in Endor from uh, uh, Return of the Jedi <laughs> they look like that um and yeah. uh, then you've got you know they go into the HSAT helmet that we all know um and then you've got um leo gen's cravat which is very alley and that's in like parachute regiment colors right. so that's really nice um but i think it's it's one of the better ones because it, it goes through that sort of establishing what they're going to wear and what's going to be this iconic look for you know maybe 10 15 years afterwards with the smock um but then in terms of, of we were talking about humbugs at the start of the segment but i it, i think it's great that they drop out of wellington bombers for for bruneval because it they easily could have just used the dakotas that they had and then you see the going into the 
using the Dakotas. So I think kit wise and sort of year going through the years of that early period, it does a really good job. Um, so I think it's that, an aspect of the film I really like the, the way they show that evolution a little bit. It's yeah, quite nice. It I mentioned really in the, the berets, there's that scene where Harry Andrews um, swaps out his uh, guard's cap for the for the for the beret, and he kind of ruefully looks at it a little bit. Yeah, that's and nice. there's 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 parts of the book, isn't there, Mark, where you talk about their reluctance to to move away from the regimental headgear, and I think that was a nice nod in the film. Mm. I know it, it. It seems bizarre now, given given the kind of blood, sweat, and tears that people expend in order to get that maroon lid uh, mm. and pass P Company and all the rest of it. But it is true that the, among the pioneers, I mean, it's very hard to generalise, Matt. But I mean, it is definitely the case that some of them were very reluctant um, and thought it was a bit of an odd colour and all sorts of odd things, which now, in retrospect, we we would mm. find hard to understand. I think there was maybe a little bit with the with the first couple of thousand, the first cadres of the parachute regiment, because they were recruited from all over the place. But they were volunteers, and they uh, uh, were older guys generally in their sort of um, late twenties, uh, even early thirties. Maybe there was a bit of a sort of vibe, a bit like the, the the special forces vibe we know now, which is that these guys were volunteers for special missions. And they'd been formed in other regimental cultures. And, and to some extent, they wanted to hang on to those, even though they were very proud of, of getting their wings and passing the parachute training. Mm. Um, so, yeah, there was a, there was a bit of reluctance, which, which, you know, in retrospect, seems, seems curious. But Yeah. No, it's all, in, it's all very interesting. I think that, that gets lost as well, doesn't it? Because even in the new, the new SAS Rogue Hero series, they show... When the when the beret comes in, people do remark, going, oh, it's a "Funny color, you know, cream." Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah it's interesting. True. So I think maybe we should move into favorite scenes. Hello, I'm Al Murray, and you're listening to Fighting on Film, the world's number one war film podcast. I, I've got to admit, maybe slightly counterintuitively, that that the scenes I most like are those where Alan Ladd is is trying to charm. Uh, the member of the Women's Air Force, the Susan Stephen character described in the Mirror Review as the love interest. It, and these take place at the um, in the parachute training at um, Ringway. And I think the reason I like them is because, uh, firstly, it's authentic. Um, th- there were a lot of uh, members of the Women's Air Force on that base. There was, there, there was when if you look at the accounts, there was a lot of uh, uh, badinage and flirting and whatever went on between the trainee paratroopers and those women they did go to the pub together as is shown and indeed there were fights in the pubs as is, as is shown in the film and I, I i also like it in a way because um the the the, the women in the film who, who who are helping out the training and and packing the parachutes they kind of don't take any nonsense from she, she she's very sort of robust with the Alan Ladd character, and and you know there's no sort of simpering, uh, 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 sort of uh, starlet roles there. It's it's all you know they give as good as they take. Mm. Uh, the, the 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 women who who are sort of part of that training establishment, and I like that. I, I like that she sort of won't won't uh, let Alan the Alan Ladd character get away with much. Uh, and I think that those kind of relationships, presumably a lot of these guys who were trained there, went away still with some passionate, uh, you know, uh, romantic attachment to to some of the women who they'd met on the base. And who knows, you know, whether they ever came back from North Africa or, or the other places where they went into action. So mm-hmm. I like that. And I like the fact that it, the film um, sort of um, explores all of that in those scenes. Yeah. Matt, what about you? What's your favourite scene? Um, I think for me, uh, and I agree, I think one thing I would have liked with the Packer uh, girls was to see them actually pack a, a parachute. That would have been great, I think, to include that. That would have been really interesting. Um, there's a great, uh, uh, I think it's a sketch that's on the Imperial War Museum's uh, archive of one of the war artists had, had drawn a load of the girls in, in one of the packing rooms with the long tables, drawing the... the um, 
the shoots up. Really interesting. I think that would have been a nice inclusion. But it's cool that you see them pulling them off the racks and stuff. Yeah, it's nice. Um, but in terms of in terms of my favourite um, scene, I think it's got to be uh, Operation Pegasus, the Brunoval um, raid, um, because you get action again, which is always great. Um, you get Leo again. We've had Leo again on the Bren in uh, Steel Bayonet, but now we get Leo again on the Sten, which is get on a Sten. Great. Yeah, get exactly. on my T-shirt. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I think there's a lot of interesting parallels that they do with that raid, and they they set it up really nicely, and it's a nice initial payoff to all those great training scenes, um, which, as Mark's already mentioned, really is probably the only. Um, training uh montage that you get to see of parachute troops in, in any of these films because the you know most famously um a bit too far you're just dropped straight into operational role you don't see any of the training and what goes into that so it's that's a that's one of the, my favorite elements of the film that they include that but as a scene i think the Brunoval raid works really well because it it's ambitious and it does the whole raid it does um it shows uh, Sergeant, I think I think I think he, the um, the character's name is Cox. Oh yeah, the RAF technician um, in in this. Uh, he's included. There's the escape down the beach um, and the the difficulty in getting contact with the Royal Navy offshore, which I thought was a nice inclusion. That which is uh, true to fact using yeah. the ferry pistol. Um, but yeah, I think there's a little bit of embellishment with the mortars and. Um, as we mentioned, within within like thirty feet of uh, the radar <laughs> position, yeah. um, and the 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 shootout in the house is quite nice. I think that's pretty well done. Although I think there wasn't quite the the firefight in the house in reality, but still, I think that scene is one of my favourites. What about yeah, you, Rob? I'll echo you there, Matt. Like I I think that that Bruneval sequence is my favourite part of the film because there's a great um, SSVC. Um, documentary from 1982 oh, yeah. i think and that was all done from veteran testimony um, made by the army film unit and it is almost beat for beat that documentary um just before you know obviously you know 20 years before but i really i really liked the assault on the farmhouse because it just felt very choreographed professional you know they're throwing grenades into rooms that they're, they're gunning down lads they were looking out for each other i think a chap comes out of a room and someone goes watch that jerry there and he gives him a d- douse of sten um it just felt very professional and it, and it sort of showed i like how it you've got to have the training element of the film now we've got the mission element and it shows that these lads are they're ready and they're ready and willing and doing their job to the to the highest um highest way they can do it um i just thought it was the better part of the movie and i think when the later on the action scene goes a bit just a bit by numbers I wanted a bit more from that ending action scene there, but it was it was good. But no, I, I think I echo you, man. The Bruno Mal bit, my favourite part. And because it's a raid, you don't often see anything done from. Well, it, that's true. And it, it's obviously such an important raid in the the, the parachute regiment's history. And, and yeah. It, um, I think the only other uh, time I've seen that raid represented in film is in... Um, Oh, what's it called? School for um, School for Scientists. Okay, and that's an obscure early fifties like black and white film where they they do a similar raid, but they take like the scientists with them on the raid. The 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 ah par- they they do a little bit of parachute training, <laughs> and that's shown in that film as well. And then they take them on the on the actual raid, which is which is interesting. And it's beat for beat the the Brunoval raid, but um, Boffin, with, with Boffins. a completely different name. Airborne Boffins. Yeah. I, I mean, I I. I Having having um, gone schmaltzy and 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 gone for the the the, the ringway scenes with the parachute packer, I, I I agree with you that the the Brunoval scenes are very well done. Um, they they do pretty much respect the history uh, of the raid, um, and it is interesting to see it on film. Uh, and, and yeah, I think as as you say, Matt. I mean, the the the, the nice moment where they don't think the navy is going to come, um, and then they do is is very well done. I mean, if we talk about the other big, um, I suppose, action set pieces near the end, what they've done is they've 
uh, they've sort of elided, they've mixed up the events of the, the first airborne drop in North Africa at a place called Bone, mm. uh, which was done by the 3rd Parachute Battalion under Geoffrey Pine Coffin, uh, who indeed features prominently in, in my Red Devils book. Uh, and and events with Johnny Frost, uh, who otherwise seems to be the central figure in this car- in this uh, film, uh, uh, in terms of the parachute hierarchy, um, he, he uh, which was at Udna, where obviously they, they the bone operation was a very successful one, and the Udna one was an absolute disaster, yeah. and, and they'd sort of mixed those two together, and and you know the sort of scene near the end where the paratroopers are sort of hemmed in against a minefield and they have to come up with a innovative way of, of escaping to safety is of course a complete invention. And so I, I suppose one could say working back from there, um, that hats off to them for, for, you know, respecting the, the Bruneval raid, at least in the way they did. Yeah. No, that's very I true. think you're right. Yeah. So maybe before we go into final thoughts, we've got a couple of questions for Mark from our Patreons and we'll try and fit as many in as we can. Um, So Rob Hughes um, goes with um, what task did the paratroopers perform in the Second World War that seems to have been got been forgotten in comparison to Market Garden? Well, I would I would have to say that uh, I suppose there are two key episodes, one of which um, is is pretty important in in my book Red Devils, which is which is the Tunisian campaign, uh, and which many say, and and you know even some said at the time, was really the place where the parachute regiment earned its reputation as as a, as a absolutely top flight mm. fighting force, um, and it was very unglamorous. There were reasons at the time why they didn't want to give publicity to the fact that they were there, you know, under the sort of rubric of secrecy they didn't really want to to talk about the parachute first parachute brigade being there uh the, the other episode which i think is very much a sort of forgotten one in 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 the regiment's war story is the um the rushing over of the sixth armored division to help uh block the german breakthrough in the battle of the bulge at the end of 1944 which uh i, I don't think anyone's going to make a film about that but um <laughs> It, it is also a, a sort of completely forgotten episode in which uh, you know, can argue that both of them, you know, the long and very difficult service in Tunisia on in these border fights in the hill country in Tunisia and and uh, the Ardennes one really were harbingers of a sort of future role yeah. uh, uh, and of the role that would survive the war, which was not mass airborne assault in the Arnhem style, but was of, you know, a highly mobile um, highly trained light infantry who could be moved somewhere to a point of crisis very quickly and could be relied upon to, you know, stand their ground or deliver an assault, uh, you know, with great professionalism. So I think those are the sort of neglected aspects of the mm. of the regiment war story. Yeah, no, fascinating. Um, Jamie D goes with, what level of access to the parachute regiment and its veterans were you afforded when writing the book? Um, well, that's an interesting question. The the, um, the the Airborne Assault Museum at Duxford, which is the, the main uh, custodian of airborne history, were very involved uh, from the get-go. In fact, they were sort of involved before I was. I mean, they oh. were involved in discussions with Penguin about wouldn't it be a great thing to have a book uh, for various reasons uh, in the coming year, year or two. And they then worked out that I was the person they wanted to write it. So so they were very involved. And uh, they also, you know, when I'd finished the, uh, the curator there, uh, the wonderful John Baker, checked my um, checked my manuscript, you know, for errors, all, all that sort of thing. And, and the reverend itself had a read as well. But uh, interesting uh, uh, that the question also mentioned veterans. Now, uh, at a very early stage, when I was talking to John at, at the Airborne Assault Museum, he said to me, there's no one still alive from the 2nd Battalion uh, of the Parachute Regiment at Arnhem. Um, and I was a bit surprised by this. I mean, obviously, I, I was aware that numbers were dwindling very, very quickly mm. uh, and that we've lost a lot of veterans, you know, in the last five years. Um, but but I was a bit surprised by that. Uh, and obviously, well. You know that put paid to any idea I might have had of actually uh, interviewing participants uh, in Arnhem or, or the other uh, 
battles that the second battalion which does figure pretty heavily in the book uh was involved in so uh you know that 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 was that really uh, and yeah. i decided then to really focus on trying to find things like collections of letters and journals and things which maybe hadn't been used before um in order to really sort of bring alive the spirit of the times and and, and the thoughts and things that people were doing at the time mm. yeah i w- i love how you you use the the sort of the, the main players and a few other chaps to really help tell the narrative and men who were in it for a long time i really like the way that you get to know these people through the book, but then you also get this really rich context underneath. I think that's what I enjoyed about reading it, um, really did. Um, and we've got uh, one last question from before we, we wrap up and go into final thoughts um, by, from Thomas McCall. He asks, Mark has previously written about tanks in the Second World War, the 95th Rifles in the Napoleonic War, and now the Paras. If a limitless budget was available, which one of these books would he depict onto the big screen? What a great question. Um, I think rifles. Because, That'd be good. That'd I mean, be OK, good. yes, there's the Sean Bean stuff and, you know, Sharp, Sharp and all that. But as we know, um, you know, the idea that their, their major Napoleonic battles are sort of eight blokes running in circles around <laughs> the camera has become part of the kind of Sharp law uh, and something that people both love and, and and can't help pointing out about those programs. So yeah. yes, the the words unlimited budget got my attention there. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and if you could, and also the other thing about it is, um, uh, uh, I'm going to, to tell you a quick anecdote about the Falklands, where okay, um, the, the the Argentine jets were screaming over the task force as they tried to unload in San Carlos water, and the flak was going up. And and the guy in charge of the amphibious task force turned to Robert Fox, the journalist, and said, do you know the one thing that's great about this, Robert? Um, when they make the movie of this, there'll be no parts for Americans. Um, <laughs> now, uh, it, it, of course, you know, the, the point is, that's why there is no movie. Yes. Uh, of of yes. Other, other than Carlos. Stuart's, obviously. Be, because, oh, yeah. and, and, and it gets back to why Alan Ladd is is the star in this film about British paratroopers in, in World War II. Now, so if you if given the unlimited budget, I would therefore defy the laws of Hollywood gravity uh, and make the, the Peninsula War sort of definitive uh, story, Band of Brothers style story about a hard-bitten group of riflemen going through the Peninsula War. Well, that'd be quite something. I really enjoyed Rifles when I read it a few years ago. Um, Thank you. I, I think... I think Fusiliers would be really interesting, but the scope of it and how how the you know the the sheer length of that of that conflict and the yeah, I think it was about seven years worth of um, yes of of campaigning and it was you know the thread that you you took through that with the, the again with those main characters of from the actual um, battalion was really interesting. The, Lots of parts for Americans in that one, really of course. hard to make. Yes, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, that's great. So well, maybe with the Napoleon coming out with Ridley Scott's big epic, maybe, yes, maybe someone will option your book. Who knows if the, that one does well? <laughs> Could be a check and in the And CGI does let you do the big battle scenes now. Of course. But... Yeah, it does. Um, something that this film maybe could have helped with. So, um, oh, hang on. I've just missed a question off for the end there. Silly me. Sorry. This is the last question, quickly, before we do move on to final thoughts. A.D. Bond asks, do you think Operation Biting set the standard for future parachute operations? Well, one of the guys who was on it, uh, McLeod Forsyth, a sergeant from the Argyle and Southern Highlanders, who who was in the C Company of the parachute um, battalion that did it, he said when he was later recording his oral history, and he is one of the featured people in in Mm. my book, he sort of said, oh, that was the only lot, one of the lot that, that actually went as it was supposed to go, because, of course, he'd also uh, been involved in some pretty uh, disastrous operations in Tunisia and all the rest of it, and, of course, by, and knew about Arnhem and everything else, um, having survived the war. Mm. Um, so, so, and I think Frost says something similar in, in, in his autobiography, that, that uh, you know, it, it was a sort of great operation. But unfortunately, it was you know rather different to to, to the others that they yeah. uh, became involved in. Um, so um, I think it's great that the film you know commemorates it. 
Yes. Uh, but of course, as as a raid of a company, yeah, you know, grouped 120 odd souls, it was rather atypical. Uh, but you know, succeeded in its aims and um, and was a was a great chapter in in their history. One hundred percent. I always feel maybe it's because you have the commandos go on to do more of that raiding type thing, and I yeah, just the way and I the SAS they, and the SAS, of course. So I think they sort of maybe pigeonhole the paratroopers for something just a bit more grand, maybe. But then obviously you could argue that uh, Coup de Man at Pegasus Bridge in 44 is that type of raid just on a much bigger scale. So I think they're doing similar things, but just more much larger, perhaps. But that, that's just me. Anyway, moving in to final thoughts. What do we think? <laughs> I think it's a good one for a rainy Sunday afternoon. I mean, you can watch it on YouTube. It's it's very easy to, to access. You don't need a streaming service. Um, and, and as I say, I think the charm of, of the early training scenes, uh, the accuracy of Bruneval, uh, those other things, it, it's it's true to, the, I think, a lot of the scenes in it are true to the sort of spirit of mm. the early pioneers of, of the Parachute Regiment. Yeah, I think that, that's being, I, I, yeah, I do agree there. But I, I think for me, the, the big sticking point for me is Alan Ladd. I just don't think he's, as much as he's a classic actor of that era, I think he's playing it too much like a Western at points. He feels like this sort of, you know, Clint Eastwood-esque man of little words type character. And he just doesn't bring enough gravitas. I never feel like he's proud to be a paratrooper. I never feel like he really is genuinely in, involved. I would much rather the film have been Leo Gain as the main character um, about Frost and about a, a a leader having to mould these men and create this regiment because it seems like it's in there at times, but it just doesn't ever, mm. he doesn't ever get there. But Gen is just fantastic at playing in, at COs anyway. So I think that's why I enjoyed him the most. Um, and I just, I think it's, a sh I just think it's a shame this movie because it could have just been a, a lot more and it feels very dated in where we talked about the back projection. I think the Technicolor really doesn't age very well. Um, as as much as black and white does, um, and I think it's the weakest of the parachute uh, films that feature the parachute regiment that we've done on the pod. But as you say, I do think it is something you can just stick on on a Sunday afternoon with a beer or a you know a cup of tea and some biscuits and just sort of sort of just zone out to. What do you think, Matt? I think mean, just to just to mention that I think we talked about the back projection before we hit record. But yeah, so at the beginning of the film, there's some bits in the, um, the hangar, which is supposed to be ringway, where it looks like there's a, they've project done a back projection and filmed some of the speaking scenes separately. Um, and there's a little bit of that at the end where the um, the Daimlers go by yeah. um, and Gens talking to um, um, talking to Lad over the grave of um, Harry Andrews. Um, but yeah, I. I it's a, it's a tricky one because the character is so acerbic at the beginning of the film that that it almost goes on a little bit too long because you just you don't become um interested in what happens to him you're not invested because of yeah. how um how just brash and unlikable he is with people and obviously the interactions with penny break that down a little bit which is good uh, and we find out a little bit of his backstory. But it does take an awfully long time to get to that. But I think that's, as I said earlier, 50-50 between the writing and the way that Lad has interpreted that and, and, and acted. So generally speaking, I think the film has a number of elements that I, that, that add to it. Or I mean, let me rephrase that. The film has a number of elements which um, are, are positive in that we have that great training sequence the uh, the depiction of of biting Bruneval, and then there's there's inclusions which are really interesting. Like the, we we've already talked about the you know the the inclusion of drop canisters and the explaining of Roman candling and the showing of the balloon drop. Um, I think they're all really nice things to to you know include that give the film a little bit more. Um, uh, what's Oof, the word that I'm looking perhaps. for? Yeah, they, they give it a little bit more um, depth. I think. That's it. And there's there's a scene in I think on the way to Bruneval where uh, Frost or uh, Snow gives a uh, an anecdote about his time in India, which is obviously based on 
other people from the um the regiment because frost was in iraq rather than than india um and he talks about a battalion of gurkhas that volunteer on mass uh to be paratroopers um not knowing that they were going to have parachutes he says the you know gonna, we're going to jump from a thousand feet and the the subadar says can, can we not you know jump from 500 and frost <laughs> the snow explains that we're at, you know the parachutes weren't open they go oh right we didn't know we're having parachutes and that that's a nice way of like including the fact that there was a, a you know indian parachute uh, battalions as well i thought yeah. that was a, a really interesting way of doing that although it's a little off the cuff and let's have that movie a, a funny scene yeah isn't it, i mean in a way um my final word would be is isn't this the classic sort of hollywood faustian bargain you know uh, uh, that, that a writer, having said in 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 the sort of style of Richard E. Grant in the play, "No stars, no stars," uh, then finds out that the only way this film is going to be made is with a Hollywood star, uh, yeah. and I suppose the sort of problematic aspects of having Alan Ladd in it, uh, maybe we just need to accept that you know if he hadn't done the movie it never would have been made so all these other little beautiful time capsule things that we see in there would never have been recorded that's very yeah, true exactly that's very true exactly um, i just just one thing i would add is i it's nice to see um the film is introduced with baker doing that hand-to-hand sequence and although he's terribly overdubbed and it's it's i'll never jarring. get over that matt it, i'll never get over no, it i'll never get over and, it and, <laughs> That sequence of 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 him um, being so brash in the plane, I'll go first, show you how it's all done, you know, show you all how it's done, and then you're just not expecting him to have that that fate. Um, yeah, where the he, Roman candles, Roman candles yeah. Um, yeah. himself, and, and they show um, him hitting the floor as well. I thought that was yeah, they do. Very and it's very hard, striking. Mm. Um, I couldn't put that in favorite scenes, obviously, but that no, is a, a noteworthy scene. Yeah. No, I know what you um, mean. But to sum up my thoughts on the film, I think I agree with Mark in that it you can accept its flaws and appreciate the things that it does highlight. Um, and it is, yeah, I think it is uh, one of those weekend weekend films. Yeah, and I think nine times out of ten on the pod, we usually end up thinking that anyway, unless we truly hate something. We've not really done that for a while. <laughs> so... I mean, if you haven't read Red Devils yet, I finished it this week. It is fantastic. If you know, if even if you're a novice of the about the parachute regiment, where well, you think you know it all, you're going to find something in there. It's a triumph, Mark. Thank you so much for joining us. I listened to the uh, the audio book, and I must say that the accents that you did in the the audio book were phenomenal. Oh yeah, yeah I think I w- I really wasn't sure when I left the recording. I really wasn't sure whether that had been a good idea, but oh, no, thank, I liked it. Thank you I anyway, it was Matt. great. <laughs> you could yeah. you could have overdubbed Harry great. Andrews much better than they did. So, ah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, well, that comes from having served in a Scottish regiment. You see. Oh, well, there we are. There we are. So, uh, as always, you can find the back catalogue of the podcast by visiting fightingonfilm.com and um, start from episode one and catch up with us. And we will catch you again next week, everybody. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. Bye, bye. <laughs>